just preparing for the live stream. Yeah, that's working. Hi everyone, thanks for joining today. Um, welcome to today's Mask Inaugural Lecture. Um, today we are um, hearing from Darren Green. Um, Ellie Cartwright will introduce Darren in a sec. But yeah, just wanted to welcome everyone. Thanks for joining today and hope you enjoy the event. Please feel free to have your video on just to make the session a bit more human. Um, ask any com uh, share any comments and questions in the chat as well, if you'd like to. Uh, these will be covered at the end of Darren's talk. Over to you, Ellie. Thanks very much. Fantastic. Thanks. Thanks, Jane. So um, for people that don't know me, I'm Professor Ellie Cartwright. I'm Head of Division of Cardiovascular Sciences at, at the University of Manchester. And it's, it's a real pleasure for me to be introducing Darren to give his um, MASK inaugural lecture. So, so MASK, or Manchester Academic Health Science Centre, to give it its full title, it's an organisation that brings together healthcare professionals, academics and researchers, and with the aim of driving forward uh, health research and making new scientific discoveries that are going to lead to benefit for patients. And so we're here today to celebrate um, Darren's award of the MASK Honorary Clinical Chair. So, so this is an appointment which gives the gives the University of Manchester, um, enables them to uh, recognise the achievements of distinguished individuals from, from the NHS. So, and it's really fantastic re recognition and one that's, one that's hard won. So to receive an award like this, you have to be making a fan, an outstanding contribution to your clinical profession. And alongside that, conducting excellent quality research and, and teaching. And, and Darren, as, as you'll all know, excels in all of these areas. And as you'll hear from his, from his presentation, he's mixed um, clinical practice and research right from the very early stages of his, of his career. So as a consultant in acute medicine and nephrology, Darren's known internationally for his expertise in the acute and long-term management of renal disorders in patients with, with heart failure. And his academic endeavours really complement this, this clinical expertise with his excellent publication and numerous um, grant awards which are focusing on cardiorenal medicine and patient outcomes. And then to the top of all of that, on top of all of that, Darren finds, finds the time to mentor and train the next generation of, of clinicians and, and researchers, including many PhD and um, MD researchers and medical and physician associate students and trainees. So without further ado, I think it is now my pleasure to hand over the the virtual floor to Professor Darren Green. Thank you very much. I will uh, share my slides. Can everyone see the presentation there? Not yet, no. Awesome. Yeah, that's on screen now, I hope. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> so no, thank you everyone uh, for joining us. Thank you, Ellie. Uh, for the introduction. Um, so I, I titled this All Roads Lead to Rome, mostly because, I mean, as Elias has said, my work is, is on patients with heart failure and CKD, but that, that was not necessarily my intention when I set out on the clinical academic journey, but everything led to that patient group, and that's, that's where I am now. Um, the, the presentation is... is I've tried to concentrate on the journey rather than um, the study results. Um, so this is more about how things have led to where they are, followed by some discussion around where the team are going and then some personal reflections at the end of it. As I say, there's not a huge amount of clinical and research data in here, but I don't think anyone 
has joined us for the CPD points. Um, so the first slide is my attempt at devising a schematic of the different components of my career pathway since being a registrar and some of the topic areas and work streams that I've been involved in at each of those stages. And I, I, the point I would, I'm would i going to try and get across, I don't know how successfully, is that all of these things, aside maybe from, from these two, are all very, very different, and yet they all um, merge along that road of, of leading to patients with heart failure and CKD. Now, at the start, as I say, that, that, that wasn't the intention, but undoubtedly, as my career progressed and it became clear that that was a the patient cohort where my efforts would be concentrated, I, I did go looking for it. Um, and I think the fact that it was everywhere reflects the fact that both heart failure and CKD are extremely common comorbidities. They occur extremely frequently together. And when they do, the outlook for patients is, is unfortunately very bleak. And so it's an important area to concentrate on. Um, so I was, I was very lucky, and luck is one of those things that you need to, to, to be successful. I was very, very lucky that when I became a renal registrar, um, my um, education supervisor was Phil Calra. And I have to say at the start, and I'm not saying it's because he's on, he's on the meeting, but I, I wouldn't be where I am now without Phil. I am eternally and always will be eternally grateful to him for the support and guidance he's given me throughout my career um, at, at every step. Um, so the first project I worked on for Phil was the astral trial, the renal artery revascularization versus medical therapy. Um, he, um, he then very graciously funded and supervised my PhD, which moved to sudden cardiac death. Um, I, I managed to get an, an ACL post, um, a postdoc post, and again during that period. Um, I was being pulled back and forth, wasn't sure where I needed to target, but settled for the renal vascular disease patients, but um, then moved into a full-time NHS clinical post, but, but still being research active. Uh, and my clinics were again focused around general nephrology, where there was a high uh, number of patients with heart failure and CKD. I still had a, an honorary contract at the university and uh, was supervising PhD students, one of whom was doing a project on AKI and um, you know, patients with heart failure and CKD were very prominent in there and so on and so forth. Um, so this is where I started. This is where I am now. I'm just going to show a few specific slides um, uh, around why I became interested in, in heart failure and to try and justify everything I've just said. Now, the interest in heart failure really um, started when I uh, joined Phil's team um, in, in the astral trial looking at patients with renal artery stenosis. And the area that piqued my interest the most was this, this um, phenomenon of, of flash pulmonary edema, as it's known, the Pickering syndrome, obviously named after uh, Pickering here from this seminal paper in the Lancet many, many years ago. And to me, these presentations were very much that of heart failure, but it was um, you know, described as a very clinically distinct and separate entity to that. Uh, the next um, significant step forward in this topic, again in the Lancet, was a paper by Missouri et al, where they described renal artery disease as masquerading as heart failure, but still uh, being distinct from it. I think if this paper were uh, reported now with uh, cardiac MR and our greater understanding of what heart failure is, um, the results uh, might be different, but of course they were reliant on late 80s grainy M mode echo, which didn't really give them the same outlook as, as, as we would have it in, in modern practice. But um, you know, it, it was clear even on the topic that what we were looking at was, was probably people who had uh, classic heart failure or potentially had classic heart failure. Um, and of course, if, if it's seen as something different, then that may alter their treatment pathways. Um, the first contribution to uh, this topic from Salford well, was this paper, and there's a familiar name there. And just to deviate slightly, again, you know, we all miss Donald dearly, but seeing the field, Donal and Steve, all that's names on here, it, and, and this was from, from the 90s, it, it's, it's very much inspirational for uh, people like myself to see um, people who are now sort of the big cheeses in nephrology internationally recognised people at the top of the game 
uh, starting off somewhere and it gives you that that uh, that theme to aspire to um, um, and the inspiration to, to try and follow in their footsteps. But back on topic, this paper, I think, was the first one really to recognise that people with heart failure also very commonly had renal vascular disease. So here, one in three people admitted to hospital with heart failure also had renal vascular disease. Uh, my first effort to muscle in on the topic was, was a review where we acknowledged the coexistence. And one could argue that if you have renal arterial bed, you... Uh, um. Yes, it just needs. We, we also know that there are multiple reasons out with that why there may be a direct relationship between like renal artery disease and heart failure. So I was developing an interest specifically in renal vascular disease and heart failure, and again trying to follow in the footsteps of, uh, of the topic in, in the Lancet here in this. Uh, mixed the observation study, we looked at outcome in people with heart failure who had renal vascular disease, which is chronic heart failure, people managed medically versus those managed with revascularization. You can see that it appears that there are signals that revascularization, renal artery stenosis may be a viable treatment for subgroup of people with heart failure. So at this stage of my career, this is where I uh, had expected things to move uh, forwards. Um, unfortunately, I, I didn't apply for a clinician scientist award at, at that stage. I moved into a full-time clinical NHS post with some research activity. Um, and here, yeah, I think we've all been in this position where we're trying to schmooze with uh, people we might want to work for. Um, and I, I had, I remember a conversation with the department manager at uh, Salford in, in renal medicine when I was looking to get a consultant post there and the big bunch of golden carrots dangling in front of me by her was the uh, the prospect of doing a weekly cardio renal specialist clinic uh, um, being involved in the renal vascular clinic would feel opportunities to do um, transplant planning clinics for high risk cardiovascular patients um, but then I, I remember very well a couple of weeks before I was due to start the job once I had, had been appointed um, it was um, a week after our, our son had been born and I, I was on paternity leave, I got a call from the, the department manager saying that uh, this wasn't going to happen and I was going to do general clinics, um, being farmed out to, to Bolton to do general clinics there and to general clinics at, at Salford River, uh, possibly once once a month cardio really clinic. So at that time I thought, well, I was gutted to be honest, so I, th I thought I was going to carry on in that sort of specialist area and be able to build my clinical research portfolio. But Okay, I think if you want to move forward and be successful in what you do, you have to be an opportunist to some extent and you have to make the most of the situation you're in. And to be honest, I think things worked out better for what happened because I mean, we know that one in five people with CKD have heart failure and the bulk of those run their local heart failure team. And we know that around half of people in heart failure clinics have CKD. Um, and so it was clear that to provide really robust uh, um, and um, joined up care for the people in my renal clinics, I needed to work very, very closely with the local heart failure teams. And what doing the general clinics gave me is a really, really good view of the landscape from both the point of view of the cardiology departments and the renal departments and, and a working relationship with the um, cardiology team in a, in a renal hub site but also a DGH and it was clear at this point that heart failure and CKD uh, was going to be the topic where I was most focused rather than only heart failure with renal vascular disease although that did remain uh, an area of, of specific uh, specialist interest um, for me and, and working with other heart failure teams has really really enhanced my ability to deliver good renal care um, I mentioned a, a PhD student who I was, I was supervising whose topic area was acute kidney injury. And of course, if you go looking for heart failure and CKD in any topic, you will find it's a heart failure patients have one of the highest risks of developing an AKI during hospitalization and one of the worst outcomes. So you know, nearly one in three people with heart failure who have an AKI will unfortunately die during their admission. And then again, readmission risk. Of all of the patient groups we looked at in our readmission, uh, work streams, the highest uh, risk group are those with heart failure, CKD, and particularly the AKI group. So uh, this combination 
uh, patients have uh, nearly 50% likelihood of being readmitted within six months after discharge. So, so at this point, I, I then um, began to focus on, on looking at the whole landscape. Of the analogy I always think of, and one thing that I, 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 I leaned on was that Dave Brailsford and his, 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 his um, team sky and, and GB cycling approach of marginal gains. And the concept there being that if you want to make an overall difference, you have to address all components. And you know, the people with heart failure CKD are extremely vulnerable at all points of contact within healthcare provision. So to make a difference to that population, we had to have a fairly broad look at the landscape and deliver uh, projects in all areas. But going back here, again, I, I was very fortunate that I had the support of Phil um, and, and even here, he, he was very, very supportive of me. But to, uh, to try and forge new areas of work requires funding, ultimately. And there's only so, so many times I can go to Phil and ask him for money and support. Um, but it was necessary for me to um, try and, uh, and get funding of my own. And that, I found that actually very, very uh, difficult to come by. And it was actually not until much later in the sort of career timeline that I was able to get the sort of funding that's now allowing us to move forward and develop really, really strong uh, programmes of, of, of work. Um, and so one area I just want to concentrate on is you know, the mask chair so i've developed collaborations within mask and partnerships within pharma um so so what difference does, does a chair make I, i'm just I, I haven't embedded this presentation because i um was too cheap to pay for it so i um i'm gonna stop sharing and then re reshare my other screen um if it come up um so this, like this, this is uh, so th this is a timeline of my uh, research funding since when I began my. PhD. Um, now, I, I was fortunate in that the first time I tried to get a research grant, it was successful. Um, that was a Kidney Research UK project grant. But I mean, the downside to that was it set an expectation that for many, many years I wasn't then able to match. So from then on, multiple attempts didn't come to fruition. I mean, the period during my postdoc is when I probably should have been most fruitful uh, in order to help me develop a Christian scientist award didn't come to anything. So I went into a consultant post um, in the NHS, of course, being in a full-time clinical post and research active and trying to forge a career, write the papers, do the projects and write the grants was, was very, very uh, difficult. Um, so again, you can see nothing was really coming in for, for a number of years. So we're doing lots of projects based on opportunism, using the what's going on within the clinical environment to, to try and take projects. Now then in late 2020, I got a visiting chair at MMU and it was around this time last year that I was appointed into the mask chair. And this graph goes up to the end of 2023 because you can see that what was happening is once I'd had the, the, the mask chair particularly, the opportunities for funding predominantly from industry have skyrocketed. So again, this goes up to the end of 2023 because we've got three more uh, industry partnership projects that we're about to sign off on. So it's effectively, it's here where the, the, uh, the visiting chair came, and then it's here where the mask chair came. And immediately the interest, particularly from industry partners, were, was far, far greater. And similarly, the interest from people uh, who invited me on to, to um, advisory bodies or uh, guideline groups also increased. And of course, once you're in that cycle where you are able to do these things, you get better at it. And so the effect is snowball. But again, we're here because I've been very, very lucky uh, to have been uh, given a mask chair. But this, I think, very, very clearly shows the impact of a chair in terms of 
you, there's a degree of success you've achieved, but then if you want to take that forward, the mask share has, has hugely helped me already within just the last uh, 12 months to, um, uh, to do that. Um, so going back to uh, the, the slideshow, um, this is where we are now. We're now in a position where we can push forward with multiple projects that we want to do rather than being dependent on using uh, facilities available to us. So there's six areas that we're working on for patients with heart failure and kidney disease. There's obviously the diagnostics again from within MASK. We're very lucky to join up with, with Prof Wayne and help her translate her findings in her animal model of uh, microRNA biomarkers and HEFE into human subjects. Are these biomarkers also viable in, in, in uh, humans with HEPA? Now, I'm going to come back to the outpatient services in sh in shortly because that's where the bulk of the work we, we're doing is. Um, I mean, we, at the moment, we're coming up with a UK wide standardized AKI bundle, uh, which again, one asks why is someone with a, a specialist interest in heart failure and CKD co leading on a project like this? This is, this is Society of Acute Medicine, UK Kidney Association. Uh, led projects supported by GERF and other, other bodies. But ultimately, our patient group are the most vulnerable patient group to some extent in terms of the immediate risk from an AKI, but mostly the downstream impact of current AKI care bundles massively impacts the long-term outlook for these patients in, in a negative way. So it's important that we as a stakeholder group, those people interested in this disease area, are heavily involved in work through such as that. Um, we're looking at novel interventions, again, through uh, mask uh, collaborations, and obviously research underpins what we do, both the local projects we're trying to do that support the next generation of research is in the same way, way that Phil has, uh, has supported me and, and others. And of course, through my role at the CRN, we're supporting clinical trials. And one thing we're trying to do is cross-pollination of trials. The cardiovascular trials, cardiology trials can, can recruit via renal clinics and, and vice versa. Um, I want to come back to this to show, again, slide sets like this, they're, they're fairly brief in the way they're presented, but you know, th what, three words there, integrated heart failure, CKD clinics, and what does that mean? Well, for us, it means this. It actually, we've got, this, this is the Salford uh, Cardiorenal Metabolic Service structure. There's 15 components to it. I can't take any credit at all for the diabetes work. That's nothing to do with me. Other people are, are leading the way there. We've got 12 different components to the heart failure CKD service that we've been trialing. And as far as we know, eight of them are unique to the service we're trying to deliver. And of those eight, at least six are, we're, we're getting really good wins uh, with them. Um, so this is what we're doing. So those you know, little things like this uh, are huge pieces of work, multiple um, uh, stakeholder groups, many, many people involved in years and years of work. And of course, we've got the frontline clinic delivery, but then we've got the backup support to it. But also, if you want to make a long term success of something new, you can do a, a, a service evaluation and, and a business case. But you need to invest in the staff that are then going to deliver that in an autonomous and self-sustaining way. So we are involved in you know, setting up uh, postgraduate diplomas, ACP master's courses, providing clinical placement for other people who want to get involved in these work streams. Um, so that's where we're going uh, now. And just a quick example, I want to, I want to credit the various heart failure teams I work with for being you know, really, really important. This is as enthusiastic as I am in, in this area. So we have a heart failure nurse bed clinic in the renal department where they see people with CKD. So they've got the support of the renal services to drive forward, given the four pillars of therapy for their patients who might be at renal risk because of those drugs, knowing that they've got us with them, but also they can provide early interventions for some of the renal issues. Um, and by doing this joined up care, you can potentially massively increase capacity within these clinics rather than having two parallel overlapping services. So they focus on providing the four pillars of heart failure therapy, and we're pushing towards half of people being on all four pillars, despite having advanced CKD. But just provide, by providing those treatments, you improve proteinuria, you improve blood pressure, and you don't really dent the GFR. So you 
by managing heart failure, you do effectively manage the CKD, and they're adding in things to their armory around uh, um, iron treatment, blood pressure control, uh, early bone disease treatment, uh, which are all very, very effective. Um, so, okay, from going back to the start, all roads lead to heart failure from a clinical point of view. For me, as a nephrologist, as a, a personal uh, um, on a personal level, if I've got a few minutes to do it, um, you know, all roads lead to, to Manchester, Greater Manchester for me, for Salford uh, and Manchester. And I mean, not even that all roads lead there. I've never actually left, to be honest. Um, so I started, I went to medical school in Manchester. Um, and then um, for my house jobs and SHO rotations, I went all the way over the road to Manchester Royal. Um, and then I went down to Wigginshaw for a little bit, which the docks under, under me. And then went to Salford to um, um, start my registrar training, back to the University of Manchester for my PhD. A few months up in Preston and then straight back down to the university for my postdoc, and then back at um, uh, Salford for my consultant post, but all the while also holding an honorary contract at, um, at, at the University of Manchester. So throughout my time in Manchester, which extends back to the mid 90s, I've always had either a substantive or honor honorary contract of some sort with the University of Manchester. And every time I've needed a, a new staff card or, or, or student card, they've always just given me a new one with the same photo on it. Usually I've either lost it or I've um, or I've just broken it, scraping ice off my windscreen. But it meant last year when I when I got the mask chair, my university staff card actually has a photo of me on it from when I was a medical student. Um, so there's me, there's me, Professor Darren Green, actually when I was when I was 20 years old at, at, at medical school. Which I, so you can see it's run out. Every time I've been on campus since then, I've just gone, oh dear, I can't find it. And someone's let me in. But I'm tomorrow at the, um, the BHF Accelerator meeting. And I have, um, so um, Joy told me off and I haven't one on, on me last time I went there last week. So I'm going next week to, oh, sorry, tomorrow after the accelerator meeting to get a new card. And I'm, I'm just hoping that they, I suppose, because I'm hoping it's either old and a, and a bit bald these days, but I'm hoping they, they, they stick with it. And all the way through to my retirement, I can have the same photo of when I was 20 years old on it. Um, so look, I will, I will try and stop shortly. Um, what have I learned on this journey? Look, I, 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 um, what have I learned about myself? I, I don't know. I've practiced these slides this morning and for about the millionth time I changed these, these three bullet points. I think persistence is, is the skill that I have in, in abundance more than anything else and fairly thick skin alongside that. I, I think luck and opportunism have been on my side as well. Perhaps you forge your own luck, but again, I'm grateful to people around me. And again, for the last time, Phil, ever so grateful for everything you've done for me. And it's clear, you know, we, we that I am, for whatever reason, far better at, at developing industry partnerships than 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 I am getting grant income. Although again, things are doing better from there now. But we've got really, really good uh, funding from pharma, and perhaps that reflects me being within the NHS as a, an academically active um, NHS consultant rather than it being within the university with an honorary NHS contract. Um, and what's my advice to others? I think along the way you learn how not to do things as well as how you should do things when you make those mistakes or those things that haunt you years down the line when you're sat on a train thinking oh god why did I do that about something that happened um, years and years and years ago um, you can learn from and there, failure is useful I think success comes from failure doesn't it um, I think it's absolutely vital that you collaborate with people you like and trust um, the, the best ideas, the most open uh, and honest conversations come with people that you, you get on with. And then ultimately, the most valuable resources are the time of people, but it's basically people's time, isn't it? You need to look after the people around you, protect them, nurture them, and they'll become the next uh, generation of, of, of researchers and, 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 and clinical academics. Now, finally, at the start, I mentioned this obsession I developed around Pickering syndrome, flash pulmonary edema, it's heart failure. If, if my academic career ends here, for whatever reason, I think I will have a, 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 a happy academic death because in this, this uh, the KDIGO Improving Global Outcomes conference paper that we wrote last year, um, the section on heart failure, here we go. We, we, we've, we've got what we wanted, acute pulmonary edema in patients with renovascular disease, likely represents acute decompensation of 
boost the unloading heart failure. So I th I'll, I'll, I'll end there because that, you know, that's uh, this one sentence in this one paper um, uh, for me was, was probably the, the biggest win I've had and, and the biggest win I possibly ever, ever will have. So there, finally I've stopped. <laughs> That was absolutely fantastic, Darren. I, I can give you a, a real a real clap. We can have some virtual virtual claps. And um, has has anybody got any questions for Darren or or any anything that they'd like to like to say at this at this time? I wonder, Phil, whether you you had any any stories to tell, any anything that you want us to know about Darren. I noticed, I noticed, noticed Darren's wife's on here, so she might have one or two stories too. But uh, yeah, um, but no, no, very much. I, I'd just like to say this, actually. Um, and Darren, thank you very much for um, the the accolades. You've done it all yourself, though. Um, and um, we are really, Ellie, we're really lucky to have Darren. I, I really mean this. Um, so we're really lucky to have a guy that is so keen on pulling together heart failure and CKD. I can tell you without a doubt, because... My, my brother's a heart failure specialist in the South and was the former the, you know, British heart failure president um, of, of the UK. Um, there's no one like Darren. There's no one who does what he does. He sits on the nice board for heart failure representing CKD. It, you know, his, his, uh, the work that he puts in, conscientious work that he puts in with all of these MDTs around the patch, clinically, as well as having an eye for the academic is, is unique. There's nobody else like him in, in the UK like this. So, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's really ploughed a great furrow, um, which is really good for us in Manchester. I'd like to say that. And, you know, he absolutely deserves this accolade. Thank you. Fantastic. We got anybody else that would like to ask a question or, or add anything? Yeah, just a quick question. I know you've mentioned Phil and um, been very grateful to Phil. So who else um, on your journey, on your career, personal, professional, has helped you? Yes, look, I, uh, uh, because I always go on a bit, as I said before, <laughs> started, my slide set was a lot longer and some of the chunks I took out was about that that journey. And, and I mean, when I was a medical student, I always had the I, I really liked the idea of being involved in research. But I mean, I was young and naive. I didn't really know what that meant. I had this idea that um, you're either a scientist in a lab with a white coat on or you're an artist sat outside a Parisian cafe with a quill, a glass of, of absinthe and, and, and musing about the world. And I, I dabbled in, the, in um, lab based research in my intercalated degree, but it was very clear at that stage that I just wasn't cut out for that. There's a very specific and admirable skill set that you need to, 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 to be a, um, a, a true scientist. And it, I, I'm just not that. So I was floundering a bit. And when I got my house jobs and my SHO job, um, I was working for people like Tony Hegarty and Pete Selby, the Hollywood Head and Simpson Triad in Respiratory. And they were, you know, um, leaders in their field, but also really passionate frontline clinicians and really nice people. And it was clear to me there that you can do um, clinical research, you can help develop policy guidelines, and you can shape the future of, whatever area of medicine you want to be in, in, a, in an academic way without needing to be that lab researcher or the absent alcoholic in, in, in Paris. So that, that gave me inspiration for working with people like Tony Hegarty, uh, Pete Selwyn, Mike Davies, I think that Hardywood Head Simpson and, and many others uh, re really helped me un understand that, that um, you know, there, there was a space for, for me to, to, to go on in that way. And then, of course, Bill's helped me along the way. Donal was a you know, phenomenal inspiration as well. There's people all all around you. And again, I, look, one of, one of the things on my it's one of my slides about the projects we're doing at the moment is a, a collaboration on lung microbiome. And that again, my wife's an inspiration to me, which she's going to go. She's downstairs and go, oh, here he goes. But you know, that was something I borrowed from her when she was doing her MD. I just absolutely love the work she was doing. Um, and we we've actually managed to incorporate some of her work tree. Not just stolen it basically and that's an area we're looking at lung microbiome with people with fluid overload in the lungs so um you know everyone around me and sorry the other <laughs> my slide with the carrots the golden carrots around them they're from minecraft i play a lot of minecraft with my kids my kids <laughs> okay kids are, are your motivation aren't they um, now i do use minecraft as, as basically 
paediatric corporate um, team building exercises with the kids. And I, I hope they don't realise that I'm actually doing that by uh, involving conflict resolution in, in computer games. But again, you know, they, they inspire you, don't know, they, they drive you, drive you forward. So following on from that, what does the future hold? What's your future work, your future opportunities, ideas, dreams, ambitions, et cetera? Um, I, 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 I want to see integrated heart failure CKD services. I want it to be a multidisciplinary led service. Um, and uh, we, we, we're very lucky that we have really passionate heart failure services around here as well. So I think we'll get that, but I, I want, I want this to be a topic area that doesn't need people like me. I think it's just something, it's autonomous, it runs itself. It's normal to have this type of service. And we've got you know, highly skilled multimorbidity specialist practitioners across the MD too. So again, I'll talk about my academic death. If, if, if there's a bus uh, coming across the road as well, if, <laughs> then it, does, it doesn't need me to run these sorts of services because we've got really, really good clinicians. And that's why we're starting from the ground up. We're developing you know, advanced practice courses at the university to, to build these people um, from, from, you know, from getting the qualifications and the clinical experience as well. Thanks, Darren. I think if there's, there's no further questions or, or comments, it... It remains for me to say on behalf of the university and, and all of us on the on the call and beyond that very many congratulations, Darren. It's you know, it's a really well deserved honour. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks everyone. We'll event end the event here. Uh, thanks so much for joining and congratulations again, Darren. Thanks everyone for joining.